la bestialidad imperialista. Bestialidad que no tiene una frontera determinada ni pertenece a un país determinado. Bestias fueron las hordas hitleristas, como bestias son los norteamericanos hoy, como bestias son los paracaidistas belgas, como bestias fueron los imperialistas franceses en Argelia. Porque es la naturaleza del imperialismo la que bestializa a los hombres, la que la convierte en fieras sedientas de sangre que están dispuestas a degollar, a asesinar, a destruir hasta la última imagen de un revolucionario, de un partidario de un régimen que haya caído bajo su bota o que luche por su libertad. Y la estatua que recuerda a Lumumba, hoy destruida pero mañana reconstruida, nos recuerda también en la historia trágica de ese mártir de la revolución del mundo, que no se puede confiar en el imperialismo, pero ni tantito nada. What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode 20, Unmasking Imperialism, Exposing Imperialist Propaganda in Mainstream Media. And today we're talking about the media war, the ongoing media campaign against Nicaragua. Our sisters and brothers in Nicaragua Sandinista liberated from US imperialism, Western imperialism, who are resisting media attacks, sanctions, environmental devastation, all of the horrible atrocities of the capitalist imperialist system and continue to brave them. And today we're focusing on recent news reports about so-called government crackdowns. We're seeing the headlines already as we have predicted several months back, the so-called government crackdowns on opposition leaders and journalists ahead of the 2021 elections. Nicaragua will head to the elections this November. And we're also gonna talk about corporate media attacks against President Daniel Ortega and the ruling Sandinista government, as well as what life is really like in Nicaragua from a working class Central American diasporic perspective. And joining us today is my comrade, compañera Aminta Sea. Aminta is a Nicaraguan American sociologist based in New Orleans, Louisiana, shout out to Nola. She currently researches transnational Central American identity imperialism in the Americas and different modes of social struggle and labor organizing. How's it going, Aminta? I'm doing good, excited to be back uh, and excited to really expose a lot of the, you know, US backed manipulation of, you know, the media surrounding Nicaragua because it it's very, very layered, but um, there's a, there's so much that Nicaragüenses right now are doing to combat it, and you know, in honor of July being a revolutionary month, being celebratory month, I'm I'm excited and I feel really optimistic for for the elections this upcoming November. Most definitely, and it's really good to be able to have you back on, and and thanks again for joining and talking about Nicaragua. It's important because obviously the elections are this November. Nicaragua is one of the main countries on the front lines of resistance to US imperialism in Latin America and the Caribbean and globally as well, along with Venezuela and Cuba and Bolivia, and now Peru with Pedro Castillo in power, part of that axis of resistance in Latin America and the Caribbean. And it's important to show the attention that Nicaragua deserves because we're talking about a people in a nation that have been resisting empire for decades after overcoming civil war, uh, impose imperialist war against the people of Nicaragua who have bravely resisted contras, terrorism, sanctions, all forms of imperialism. And in a way for me, as someone who's Central American, who's Honduran, I see Nicaragua as an example of what is possible against capitalism, against the poverty of neoliberalism. And we have to defend the gains of the Sandinista revolution which are under attack right now. And we see the media attacks ramping up, all of these articles claiming that there are crackdowns on human rights, the typical script and cycle of the Gene Sharp method of color revolutions, of regime change. And it's really disgusting to see, but for people who are tuning in maybe for the first time or 
who are unfamiliar with Nicaragua, I do just want to give a quick overview of the history for the context. We have to keep repeating this, regurgitating this, because it's important because not a lot of people know the history. Uh, first off, shout out to Comrade Oliver Smith. Shout out to Comrade Salifu. Fourth, the fourth is a lie. Peace family. That's exactly right. We're not celebrating uh, the 4th of July. We're just chilling inside talking about what the empire is doing on quote unquote Independence Day. And uh, it's important to be talking about Nicaragua at this moment because the media war is ramping up and, you know, we're months away from the election. And I wouldn't be surprised if they try to launch a new coup attempt or regime change just months before the election because the Sandinistas are poised to win it and are very popular in Nicaragua right now. But just to give a quick overview, obviously, in Nicaragua being in Central America, being a colony of the Spanish Empire, eventually gained independence in the 1820s along with the other Central American countries, Honduras, Guatemala, Salvador, Costa Rica, was fragmented, destroyed. U.S. imperialism came in in the 1920s and 1930s. We have the anti-imperialist, indigenous socialist hero, Augusto Cesar Sandino, who fought directly against U.S. Marines attempting to invade Nicaragua. And he's somebody who remains a hero and the inspiration of the Sandinista government today, Augusto Cesar Sandino. In the, between 1933, uh, 34 to about 1969, we had this wealthy white right-wing family, the Somoza family, dictatorship, a dynasty, backed by the U.S., also backed by FDR, interestingly enough, in the U.S., for people who claim that FDR was some sort of progressive. He completely supported the Somoza family uh, dynasty in Nicaragua. They completely sold their country off to the U.S. They pillaged and, and enslaved people. They killed leftists. And it wasn't until 1979 that the Somoza family dictatorship, which ruled the country, were a family dictatorship that ran the country for decades up until 1979 when they were overthrown by the FSLN, the Frente Sandinista de Liberación Nacional, National Liberation Front of the Sandinistas. And from 1979 to 1989, the Sandinista guerrilla movement ran uh, Nicaragua. They implemented land reform, redistributed land to thousands of campesinos, millions of campesinos in Nicaragua, built hospitals, schools, housing for people. Unfortunately, in 1990, the elections against uh, Violeta Chamorro, Daniel Ortega, who's the president now, he lost. And in a, an election which was controversial as well, we can go into that another time. But from 1990 till 2006, there was neoliberalism, right-wing governments returning to Nicaragua, privatized everything, privatized schools. The rich came back. They took over the country again. But in 2006, Ortega won the election and this time instituted the Sandinista government in democratic socialist model. He implement, he was part of the pink tide and the progressive wave of leftist Latin American leaders like Hugo Chavez and Evo Morales, Rafael Correa and others in the region. And President Ortega has, has been overseeing the country since 2007, along with Vice President Rosario Murillo, Compañera Rosario Murillo, with the Sandinista government again, have restarted a lot of the programs from the 80s because they lost power, they came back, have restarted that whole process, building schools, building hospitals. Today, Nicaragua is the safest country in Central America, one of the most developed in Central America, one of the most equal in terms of uh, gender and sex, but also in terms of class. There isn't as much poverty and homelessness and devastation in Nicaragua compared to other countries in Central America that we see people fleeing from on the migrant caravans. So that's just a, a crash course on, on Nicaraguan history. It's important to repeat that because, again, none of this is repeated in mainstream media. None of this is mentioned the context. They just start off from the present, make it seem like it's some dictator holding on to power. And on this channel, I had a chance to travel to Nicaragua a few months ago. Um, if you want a fuller scope of Nicaraguan history, uh, check out Nicaragua Against Empire. There's also a bunch of good channels on YouTube, Revolución, JP uh, Plus, that have really good context on Nicaragua. But I just wanted to give that overview of Nicaraguan history because it's important to, to really mention that. But I mean that before we get into some of the latest news about the quote unquote crackdowns on Nicaragua, what have you been seeing in mainstream media about Nicaragua and the media war? 
I mean, as of recent, you know, I'm just thinking about how the Senate, uh, they have their committee on foreign relations. And then I believe it was June 22nd, uh, you have folks like Marco, uh, more like Narco Rubio, honestly, but Marco Rubio and, um, you know, the other like head guy of, of the organization, Senator Bob Menendez, um, and then looks like Senator Dick Durbin, Ben McCardin, Chris Murphy, they passed this Renacer Act that is uh, supposed to further implement uh, and push what the NECA Act in 2018 was, was intended to do, which was to add more sanctions to the Nicaraguan government. And I also noted um, how OFAC actually uh, managed to um, sanction four other key leaders of the Nicaraguan government. Um, and the problem with these sanctions is that a lot of people think of sanctions as just a slap on the wrist rather than really seeing it as a coercive, illegal, unilateral measure, which, mind you, is illegal off of the um, frameworks that the OAS has implemented. Obviously, we know the OAS is not actually genuine about implementing any sort of autonomy or democratic measures in Latin America. But still, if we follow the OAS measure, what the US government is doing is incredibly illegal. Um, and they, you know, have managed to sanction, uh, put more sanctions on um, Camila Ortega, uh, Danielle's uh, daughter, who um, also, I believe she run, I, I can't remember exactly what, what her like role role is, but um, they sanctioned her. They also went ahead and they sanctioned um, the member of the Special Commission on Electoral Affairs, Edwin Ramon Castro Rivera. Uh, they also sanctioned um, the general of the army, Julio Modesto Rodriguez Velardes. Um, and they also sanctioned the um, president of like the national bank uh leonardo ramirez and so why is this all important right is because these are like new upcoming sanctions that on paper if you read it and you don't have the context about you know nicaraguan history and and people's the people's popular resistance movement through the curation and establishment of the fsln uh you would think that these individuals are not you know abiding to having free and fair elections but but that isn't that isn't true because it's the u.s government that has also been funneling millions millions of dollars to right now it looks like the main opposition candidate is cristina chamorro uh who's the daughter of yoleta chamorro she was in the um she was the president during this horrible neoliberal period which privatized everything and so in the media you see a lot of you know, negative commentary saying Ortega is killing students, which we've seen this since 2018, that he's killing students, that there is widespread repression, that there's even, you know, on the basis of, of gender equality, I mean, like, not, not to go too much into tangent about it, but we see the CIA and the NED, sometimes they'll manipulate more left rhetoric to get people to support regime change in already very left governments that, you know, on an international basis. I mean, Nicaragua, first of all, I think they rank five in gender equality. Um, and it's an incredibly safe country. I can mention it myself as a woman, you know, <laughs> I feel much safer walking in Nicaragua, you know, by myself and traveling by myself and compared to much of my experiences in the United States. Um, and then also, you know, we see claims that Ortega is, um, you know, harming the environment, even though Nicaragua is an incredibly uh, eco-friendly and sustainable country that produces very little waste. We don't see those same claims or that same aggression on, you know, the the huge corporations based in the West uh, and in the United States, and all of the, the waste that they produce. Um, and so there's just a lot of media surrounding Ortega and surrounding the San Anisa party that is trying to make it seem as if it's just an outlet of repression, that they're repressing the media, which isn't true because if you go, like the Chamorros, they own so much of the uh, of the media. They own La Prensa um, and they also own uh, Confidencial, I think is the other name of the... Um, media outlet that they that they run uh, and they also have influence and mind you they get their funding from like the USAID the NED they've gotten I think a conservative estimate is maybe 
around eight to nine million dollars over the last two years. Um, and there's different reports published that demonstrate this. Um, but you just see, you know, they, they run that and there's other right wing media outlets like Radio Corporación, Canal 10, 11, 12. You also have 100% Noticias, which is run by somebody named Miguel Mora, who said in an interview, I think with the Gray Zone, that uh, they should take out Ortega like how the U.S. did with Noriega in 1989. Like, this is somebody who is actively calling for war and intervention from another foreign country. So, of course, with reason, the Nicaraguan government is going to be like, putting on charges for this person engaging in actual terrorism um, because that's also what happened in 2018 so much of the violence was was um terrorism sponsored by by the u.s government and by the west but that's not something that you might commonly see um in in a lot of western media i guess so there's a lot there's a lot of manipulation there's a lot of different layers you know i kind of always think about the ways in which imperialism operates as like a web because things that seem to be more distantly related are not that far away as soon as you begin to kind of do more research and 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 sort of uncover what's going on so um those are a lot of things i kind of just threw at you <laughs> but we can we can kind of go into more detail as as we continue this conversation but that's yeah. sort of the general that i've been seeing um with respects to Nicaragua in the media. No doubt, yeah, I think that's a good summary. And uh, shout out to uh, Comrade Salifu, to Comrade RSJ, to my lovely girlfriend Ophelia, who's watching this in the next room. <laughs> uh, Ophelia's, I mean, Ophelia's very excited to, to be going to Nicaragua soon. Uh, shout out to Comrade Itzel and everybody who's watching and listening. It's important to be talking about this because everything that they're doing against Nicaragua, like you said, they're experimenting and they're trying and testing this on other people around the world. I wanna share a clip from France 24 talking about exactly what you were mentioning with Cristiana Chamorro and the recent attacks, because I, I noticed this started kind of kicking off last month. It seems like when we were in Nicaragua, we went in March for the delegation Friends of the ATC, Sanctions Co Coalition. Shout out to both of those groups, by the way. Uh, make sure to watch and share and support their stuff. Friends of the ATC and uh, Code Pink and the Sanctions Co Coalition. They are on the front lines of the anti sanction movement, anti imperialist solidarity movement with Nicaragua. And when we went, when we came back in March, up until June, it seemed like it was kind of calm. But then in June, they started ramping up the media attacks with the arrest of. Chamorro and the human rights, quote unquote, human rights organization. So I want to play a clip from France 24 talking about that and get your response to it. Protesters call for the release of Cristiana Chamorro before being dispersed by police alongside journalists and family members. The opposition leader, who was a potential candidate in Nicaragua's election in November, was placed under house arrest after police raided her home, 15 minutes before she was due to give a virtual press conference to reporters, in a move by the government denounced as an attempt to take her out of the running. As long as there is no cause for sentencing and there is no final judgment, no one can be suspended. So Christiana's case is a gross violation of the political constitution and electoral law itself. The government has accused Chamorro of money laundering in her role as the head of a foundation for press freedom. Opposition parties in Nicaragua have accused President Daniel Ortega of pursuing a witch hunt against his potential challenger. This is an unfair accusation, a juridic monstrosity. They're attacking democracy. They're attacking the rights of Nicaraguans to vote freely in the upcoming elections. They want to intimidate us so that we don't vote and can't defeat Ortega's dictatorship. At 75 years old, Ortega has been in power since 2007 and also led the country between 1979 and 1990. He's yet to confirm whether he'll seek a fourth term. Though in recent weeks, he's made moves to silence the opposition. Chamorro is a popular figure in Nicaragua thanks to the legacy of her parents. Her mother became president after beating Ortega in 1990. While her father, deemed a hero in the fight against the Somoza dictatorship, was assassinated in 1987. So 
a lot of nonsense in that report. First, I just want to point out that uh, Chamorro's daughter, I think uh, Cristiana, she looks, she literally looks like a Nicaraguan Karen. Like she looks like somebody who would call the cops on you and be like, oh my God, these thugs, hooligans are outside. Just looking at her. I mean, she looks like your typical Latin American bourgeois right wing US aligned piece of crap. And they're just painting it out to make it seem like she's this hero. She's this person who's being attacked and being suffocated and the stranglehold. Give us a rundown of who she is and who her family is, because I don't think a lot of people are really familiar with that. Sure. So we see, particularly in the early 90s, the election of her mother, uh, Violeta Chamorro. Um, and what's really interesting to, you know, is that during her presidency, uh, this really sort of kick-started a neoliberal period. But you know, I think it's also important to mention, you know, the FSLN has always been incredibly popular amongst the working class, especially also both with the working class in the cities and campesinos, farmers in rural areas. And so having that that um, class consciousness between two different um, material conditions between workers is really essential. So even during the neoliberal period, although there was a lot of harm instituted as she tried to privatize everything, I mean, we're talking about a family dynasty that owns so much of the media and till this day is getting millions of dollars through the USAID and through the NED. Um, and so, in spite of that, they try, the Chamorros tried to engage in various constitutional reforms that were attempting to roll back the legacy of agrarian reform that the Sandinistas were able to establish. Uh, and mind you, just so that folks know, and Ramiro, I know you and I, I mean, we were in El Campo together in La Montañita, like these agrarian reforms are incredibly important because they allow for one campesinos to actively own land and to not, you know, be micromanaged or oppressed by some transnational like fruit corporation. Um, you know, we see this with the legacy of banana republics in Central America. And so the Chamorros, they wanted to roll that back, but it still wasn't, people still resisted and fought back. People want to, you know, France 24, these mainstream media sites, they want to talk about the Chamorros being, you know, this egalitarian family and they, they care so much. But I mean, these are people I mean, we're talking about a country that is also this, like the second poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. I mean, the Chamorros are absolutely, their wallets are, are filled, their wallets are loaded, like they are so far removed and they're definitely characteristic of the Nicaraguan bourgeois. Um, and it's, it's kind of interesting too, to know, you know, we see like Violeta, she was the first woman president of Nicaragua and now it's like her daughter, Cristina, she's going to kind of follow in her footsteps. And it gives me sort of like girl boss vibes, like Margaret Thatcher, like Hillary Clinton, like, oh, yeah, you right. know, women can do imperialism, too. But it's fine. And it's <laughs> it's, it's so um, dangerous because we see time and time and again, like the USAID, uh, I know that they control the National Endowment for Democracy. Also, I'm sorry if you hear someone playing trumpet outside. oh it's all good I, I i do hear it but if it sounds like we're at a coffee shop just having a conversation so it's pretty chill don't worry about it yeah it's all good um <laughs> <laughs> that's just living in new orleans honestly right. someone's playing trumpet outside but um so you see the chamorros they uh want to push this girl boss narrative but really i mean where have we seen actual equality for women be established it has been through the reforms and the um actual democratic measures established by the fsln i mean like i mentioned before nicaragua ranks fifth in gender equality um and there you know we see the friends of the atc does great work demonstrating the women-owned collectives like the farmer co uh, yeah collective slash cooperatives where women have uh, directly benefited from the agrarian reform they learn how to uh, tend the land and have different forms of crops and they themselves are able to support themselves and that's huge that's huge because it one allows for women to actively have direct material resources to sustain themselves really breaking away from you know a more patriarchal mode of of, of being where women traditionally unfortunately often had to depend on uh, on a spouse uh, to to 
make ends meet. Um, and so the fact that we have all these reforms, but France 24 won't talk about that. Um, you know, her, another, another thing about the Chamorro family that folks should know too, uh, I believe that Christina's uncle, Carlos Fernando Chamorro, he runs a group it's called Grupo Cinco, uh, which is also allied with uh, somebody named Sofia Montenegro, uh, who is part of this opposition um, party. It's uh, the MRS. Uh, I think it's like mm. the movement to reform, like to reform the Sandinistas is kind of the gist of it. It's a it's a small party. They never get more than five to six percent of the national vote. Um, but, you know, guess who, who received eighty thousand dollars from the U.S. government? The same, you know, Sofia Montenegro. And then also you have Grupo Cinco and they have there's paperwork that demonstrates that they're getting funding from the USAID, uh, the same USAID that in the 1980s uh, was funding Contra death squads. Um, and this was all always, this is always under the guise of humanitarian aid, right? And so I really feel as though the Chamorros are simply not a family that should be trusted because one, they own so much of the media already. So for anybody who wants to say that there is media repression in, in Nicaragua, that's not true because you see, I mean, I remember, I don't know if you remember this, uh, but like, even if you're just in a car, just in Managua, sometimes people will be selling different papers. Half the time they're selling La Prensa. Right, you know, right. like it's, it's not that there's like widespread repression. Um, and Cham Cresina Chamorro, I mean, it's within reason that she is arrested. She's receiving money from a foreign entity in order, and a same foreign entity that has tried to establish a violent coup that has killed people, that also killed many Sandinistas, and the ma uh, mainstream media won't report about the Sandinistas who were killed also during Los Tranques. Um, and we don't, the, that same media won't talk about how the, the funding that was established to push those tranques, push all that violence also negatively impacted the Nicaraguan economy. And right now it's still coming on the up and up, recovering from that. Um, if Chamorro, I mean, were to hypothetically win the election, we would just see less engagement um, uh, for the working class or wouldn't be investment uh, for the working class. Um, in spite of the sanctions that the US government has imposed on Nicaragua, uh, at the time, the, even the IMF, an organization that we know we shouldn't trust and you know it, it, it's <laughs> grossly imperialist, they were saying, they were applauding Nicaragua because uh, they were showing continuous steady growth. I think it was like 5% annual growth um, in their GDP uh, and that they were allocating the resources properly, the loans properly in order to have more direct development. During the Chamorro presidency, we didn't see any of that. They were getting more funds from the IMF and the World Bank, but the, guess who was hoarding all of that wealth? It was still this bourgeois family. So they're they're not to be trusted. Um, they're there meeting probably in, in South Florida with all of the other Nika, like right wingers. Um, I can't remember what like the Nicaraguan version of an Esqualido or a Gusano is right now. I just call them Contras because they're Contra. still gone. I just call them contras because they're the they're the same bende patrias, you know. They're the same um, legacy of that. And uh, actually, comrade Del Sendero had a good comment. He said, "Like Castro, Chavez, and Maduro, you have to give Ortega a lot of credit for being able to lead his country through one a brutal assault after another. A truly great leader. That's exactly right, comrade. I mean, I I think it's it's really unfortunate to see the lack of respect that uh, Commander Ortega gets because." He's the last, I mean, it's something that I think was brought to my attention when we were in Nicaragua, that he's the last president of a country in the world who came to power as a guerrilla fighter in a revolutionary period. And even, you know, in, in Cuba, for example, right now, Miguel Diaz Canel is the, the new generation of the Communist Party leadership. Nicolas Maduro as well was part of the new generation. Ortega is like one of the last OGs. Like if you were to have a conversation with Ortega now, I mean, he could tell you every. He's seen everything. He's he saw Fidel. He saw everything early on. The Soviet Union, Grenada, Maurice Bishop, and he's still alive today. So he's somebody who doesn't 
give doesn't get that respect or credit that he uh, deserves from the left, especially the the Western left, because of the media propaganda against him. And obviously, I think as well, I think the the race anti indigenous racism because he's very indigenous working class dude. He's not you know like cleaned and polished up. He's a he he's the same Daniel Ortega, and that's what I like about him. You know, he's somebody who. Um, is very working class at his roots and so i think he doesn't get the the credit he deserves i do want to share an article with you this is part of the again the 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 propaganda war um against nicaragua this is from la times and of course they have corny ass latinx files what is happening in nicaragua so they're they're trying to appeal to a a quote-unquote latinx audience right and uh, and it's just interesting, like little things. Like I just want to read some of this and, and talk about some of the imagery because it's important to debunk how they perpetuate these narratives, right? That he's uh, that he's like uh, sexist, that he's like this horrible dude. And look at the picture they pick, right? Like let's just for those of you who are listening, it's Ortega standing up, his wife uh, Rosario Murillo, Vice President uh, Rosario Murillo who has like a serious face it's just kind of they were probably just caught off guard but it makes it seem like he's kind of belittling her you know like just from the imagery right what 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 do we understand and and receive when we get from this and basically the this author, shitty ass author and his name is Fidel Martinez by the way we should revoke his name he doesn't deserve that name Fidel but this is July 1st 2021 LA Times for the last month police in Nicaragua have been rounding up and jailing opponents and critics of President Daniel Ortega. These arrests come ahead of the country's presidential election in November. Ortega is seeking re-election for the fourth time after his party successfully changed Nicaragua's constitution in 2014 to remove term limits. So the, the, a lot of word crafting here to make it seem like he, you know, it wasn't the people of Nicaragua who changed the constitution, it was his party. Um, and at least 20 people have been detained, including politicians running for president, activists, and journalists. As Times reporter Julia Barajas points out, the Ortega government is using a law passed last year that makes any act that would undermine Nicaragua's, quote, independent sovereignty and self-determination. The crackdown has caused concern and resulted in action from the international community, aka global whites and global <laughs> uh, human rights, quote-unquote human rights organization. Allies Argentina and Mexico recalled their ambassadors to Nicaragua last week, which is very unfortunate to hear. Uh, And the U.S. has imposed sanctions on four members of Ortega's administration. We continue to call on President Ortega and the Nicaraguan government to immediately release presidential contenders Cristiana Chamorro, Arturo Cruz, Felix Maradiaga, Juan Sebastián Chamorro, and Miguel Mora, and other journalists, civil society, and opposition leaders arrested in the current wave of repression, said U.S. Department of State spokesman Ned Price. We condemn this ongoing campaign of terror in the most unequivocal terms and consider President Ortega, Vice President Murillo, and those complicit in these actions responsible for their safety and for their well-being. Again, this is from the LA Times, quote unquote, Latinx files. And how corny is this, man? It's just like in spreading imperialist propaganda, but trying to sound woke at the same time. Your your reaction, uh, Comrade Aminta? I have to laugh because it's just like it's really absurd. It's really absurd, and it really just demonstrates, you know. Again, they want to frame Ortega as sexist, especially because you have Cristina and she's a woman. You know, the imagery yeah. is really powerful. I think it's really gross that they like chose this photo too, because if you know anything about Rosario, she's all about like youth engagement and she is such a pivotal member um of the nicaraguan government and i mean you know she has her own platform where she has speeches she's always about you know establishing a lot of support for um juventud sandinista and she's also done so much development to really cultivate a lot of um cultural engagement especially you know if you go to managua you see um puerto salvador allende that was that used to just be all you know um undeveloped territory land a lot of it needed to be fixed up and now it's beautiful and it's a free 
port people can go in people can you know enjoy their time we talk a lot about in the states how we wish that we had free places to gather for young people to have a, a place of belonging and a place to hang out here in 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 socialist nicaragua you have the implementation of that and a lot of that is because of rosario murillo as well she is an incredibly brilliant and talented politician and also poet i mean somebody who's really interdisciplinary in her craft and yeah. the fact that they just want to i think it's almost like like sexist, right? That they just want to like diminish her and remove all of the um, work that she has done too, because she is also a revolutionary uh, right. and she's doing just so much work. Um, and it just is, is so frustrating because again, I mean, oh, I don't know. Do you mind if we can scroll down? If I could just yeah. see some of the words here, anything that pops out, I mean, yeah, like, of course, they're going to have a law that's for independent sovereignty and self-determination. <laughs> how dare the Los Angeles Times on talk about how the U.S. has been establishing sanctions right. and a crackdown from the international community. I mean, that's, again, like, they're... The same international community is not holding the United States accountable for all the atrocities that it does internationally and also domestically as well. I mean, my God, how many human rights abuses has is the U.S. government, you know, directly accountable for and responsible for. So for them to just frame Nicaragua as, you know, this like dangerous terrorist nation is just, it's so, so dangerous. And it just makes me so mad because I think um, I, before, I really want to mention this to like, as the um, office, what is it? The office of, um, the o OFAC, I keep like not remembering what it stands for, but the Foreign Assets Control, okay, the Office of Foreign Assets Control, they have this material support clause that I think is really dangerous because um, it allows for like people, even U.S. citizens to face legal repercussions up to 20 years in prison uh, for supporting people who are quote unquote sanctioned uh, by the U.S. government. And so to just to see this, I just think it's just like, Again, these layers of manipulation, and it's just, it's just so, it's just so wrong because it's like you go to Nicaragua and it's a totally different environment, and you actually see firsthand how the government uh, is run by the people. I mean, Daniel, like if, you, if somebody in the U.S. is running for president, they're always going to be referred to by their last name, almost. Yeah. Always. For I have my own like. Uh, FSLN gear and all it says is like my hat says like Daniel 2021 and all my yep. friends they see it and some of them don't know, necessarily know that much about Nicaragua and they're like I love that this hat just says Daniel and I'm like wow, <laughs> like everybody just refers to him as Daniel, Daniel. Yep. first name basis and it's just uh, really also representative again that working class characteristic you know it's, it's a more engaged dem democratic process than anything we'd see in the U.S. So um, this this article, yeah, so many on so many levels, so crazy. many levels, and it's crazy. I mean, that's the power. That's why, I, like, my favorite quote of all time is Malcolm X: "The media's most powerful entity on earth. It makes you think your friends are your enemies, and your enemies are your friends." And that's exactly, dude. The media, the power of the media. Like, even this headline, right? What is happening in Nicaragua? It immediately makes you feel anxiety. It immediately like, what is going on? And people are like, nothing, we're chilling. Like, what? yeah, what's the problem? You know? <laughs> and it's like, it's crazy because you look at the headlines and it's like uh, uncertainty in Nicaragua, crackdowns in Nicaragua. And it's like peaceful, chill. Like we were just there a few, a few weeks ago, a few months ago. And they create, like, that's the thing. Like, even though like the media, they can create reality. They don't just like report on reality. They create reality. They're like literally writing a spell and create manifesting it and bringing it to life even though there wasn't any tension when we were there like we didn't see any political turmoil or anything like that and they're creating it by using these media reports there's this other article i want to share with you from bbc this one pissed me off a lot uh fragile leader Ni wow. nicaragua's fragile leader and his ruthless crackdown on rivals so and then they show this poster which is supposed to like insinuate that populism is bad or something. So I, I want to read a little bit of it. If I had a good British accent, I would have re read it in a British accent just to make it sound <laughs> more pompous, but I don't have a good British accent, so I'm, I'm going to spare you guys that. 
Uh, but it says, before he was murdered in 1978, journalist Pedro Joaquin Chamorro wrote an open letter to Nicaragua's dictator Anastasio Somoza de Baile. In it, he told the reviled military leader how much the people on the streets despised him and that his iron rule resembled that of a king in the children's stories. In children's stories. Three years later, Chamorro was, found, was dead, forced off the road and gunned by Somoza's henchmen. Today, his daughter, the presidential candidate Cristiana Chamorro, is under house arrest by the government of Daniel Ortega, the man who helped force Somoza from power. Her detention on money, money laundering charges is part of an alarming clampdown on high profile opponents to President Ortega and his wife, Vice President Rosario Murillo. In all, five potential candidates for the presidential election in November 2021 have been arrested, as well as numerous journalists and businessmen, most of them under a controversial treason law. We're in a period of absolute irrationality in Nicaragua, says poet and novelist Gioconda Belli, whoever the fuck that is. On Wednesday, Daniel Ortega reappeared in public for the first time since May. Looking frail, the 75-year-old delivered a typical bombastic speech which lasted for more than an hour and covered everything from North Korea's nuclear ambitions to the recent spate of arrests. He insists the actions were justified and said the detainees would be, quote, punished according to the law for supposedly carrying out crimes against the state. Quote, Nicaragua is the safest country in the region, he claimed defiantly, even though it's a fucking fact. Mm -hmm. not, not, however, if you are one of the president's critics. Gioconda Belli says Vice President Murillo's recent speeches have been equally erratic, quote, a mixture of religion and insults, which rail constantly against coup plotters and Satanism. The government's narratives exhibit extreme levels of paranoia. Oh my God. In part, the presidential couple's fear and suspicion are rooted in the events of 2018, when protests over pension reforms quickly grew into a much larger anti-government demonstrations. The authorities responded with lethal force and more than 300 people were killed. The majority of them anti-Ortega protesters false. We, we can get into that later. In 2018, they lost the streets, says Nicaraguan sociologist Oscar René Vargas. The repression was, so, was carried out so that people wouldn't return to the streets again. The treason law and subsequent crackdown are signs the president and his wife view their rule as, quote, fragile, he argues. They have turned to the, quote, only force they have left, an alliance between the military, the police, and radical pro-Ortega paramilitaries. That's another spell that they do in the media, paramilitaries, we can go into that in a bit. This is, this is a potent and frightening prospect for any vocal critic or presidential rival. Quote, they are trying to decapitate the leaders of a social movement and remove any possibility of a new tsunami of social uprising, Mr. René Vargas says bleakly. Among those arrested is Dora Maria Teles, Teles, a former commander with the Sandinista rebel group who led a split from Daniel Ortega in 1990 after he lost power following Nicaragua's violent civil war. When I spoke to her, she was in hiding from the Ortega government. A day earlier, her home, her home had been raided by government agents and she could barely hide her disgust at her former ally. So, and lastly, her, the, the treason law states in generic terms that anyone found guilty of acting against, quote, the independence, the sovereignty, and self-determination of Nicaragua could be designated a traitor. A deeply compromised judiciary can easily conflate legitimate criticism of the president with crimes against the state. So more bullshit from the BBC. Um, I think before I pass it to you, uh, compañera Minta, I mean, come on, Ortega is 75 years old and he's like looking frail. The 75, no shit, Sherlock, he's fucking 75 years old. And he's still, he's healthier than fucking Joe Biden who mm -hmm. stumbles at every fucking word. But I don't know, your response to this article, it, it pisses me off just, just reading this. I mean... <sighs> I think it's really dangerous the way that they try to create this myth, a mythology of the Chamorros, that they are this benevolent family, that they do not have all of these links and funding. I'm talking millions of dollars um, that allow for them to own all of this media, that allow for them to, you know, 
cry cry victim when really again it was a popular revolution uh when they talk about the um social security reform they also don't mention that it was originally the world bank that was telling nicaragua that they had to hire or like increase the age when you could actually retire and ortega said no like they don't they completely overlook that totally and then they don't talk about the ways in which you know the world bank uh began to work with other um intra governmental organizations to again establish more crackdowns on nicaragua uh they don't really talk about you know the ways in which their economy is structured so that it is more geared you know towards socialized public resources such as a lower retirement age or you know having access to universal health care it doesn't talk about how under the sandinistas young people can go to college and compared to you know the united states they don't have to um be indebted to a um school for 20 years paying off loans meanwhile our job market is I mean, I, I can tell you as a young person myself, most of my friends can't really find a lot of work in right. this country. And um, so it, it completely overlooks all of that. Uh, and, you know, I mean, the fact that they put in the journalist Pedro Joaquin Chamorro, like, all right, this is just a think piece by the Chamorros, just trying to amp them up, give them good media. So then when other people see other work, um, the, or things published around in Nicaragua, they're like, oh, well, you know, the Chamorros, they fought Somoza and they have to be good because they're fighting this really scary dictator because, you know, he's he's so strong and, and, and violent, but also frail and old. Like, it's really weird how they they almost like contradict themselves, a lot of the, the mainstream media surrounding uh, socialist leaders. Um, and so it's critical for us, especially in the West, to put all of our support uh, and backing for Ortega. I think that's a critical line. Like, I think that's like a litmus test for me sometimes when I'm talking to to leftists in the West. I'm like, okay, but what, what are your thoughts on Nicaragua? Because a lot of people do get confused because there is a lot of misinformation and lies surrounding the country. So, um, but it's important for people to know, I mean, it's a, it's a popular revolution um, and I mean, also, who the hell is this Gioconda Belly? Like some random Italian fuck, and <laughs> who the fuck knows? The yeah, it's just—it's really ridiculous. Um, yeah, it's really ridiculous. And even the the false parallel—that's a mind trick that they do, right? Because what they're doing here by setting up, they're talking about uh, Pedro Joaquin Chamorro, you know, writing a letter to Anastasio Somoza de Baila, as we mentioned earlier in the stream. The Somoza family was a, a, a actual dictatorship that ruled the country for decades with U.S. support, with U.S. arms training funding, an actual dictatorship. And then you have like the liberal bourgeois wing opposing that. And so they're framing this in terms of dictatorship versus democracy instead of proletariat versus bourgeoisie, which is the class distinction that we come at this. Right. And they're creating this false parallel by putting Ortega's name next to Somoza. Ortega, Somoza, Ortega, Somoza, Ortega, Somoza. If you repeat that often and often and often and often again, in the documentary, that, that's why I included that quote from that really great activist where she says, it's the classic of fascism, the classic technique of fascism. If you repeat a lie often enough, it becomes reality. And that's what they do. It, and they did the same thing with Syria, with President Bashar al-Assad, where they're like, Chemical weapons, Assad, chemical weapons, Assad, chemical weapons, Assad, chemical weapons, Assad. Just by repeating it over and over, your mind draws a parallel and you be, you begin to equate the two without it even having to be true. It's one of those techniques of brainwashing and propaganda. And it's something that's interesting because I was reading about Mossad, the Zionist Israeli uh, intelligence unit. And that's something that they did in the, in the 80s and the 90s with the Palestinian liberation movement where they equated anybody with, uh, they, they equated Palestinians and Muslims with, uh, with bombings, with like, you know, that classic stereotypical image of the Muslim with the bomb strapped around them. They, they, they funded a bunch of movies and propaganda with that image over and over so that you equate it. And that's uh, one of the techniques that I see that, that they're doing here in Nicaragua, where they're just equating Ortega with Somoza 
and praising this liberal bourgeois nonsense. And I think the other technique that they use here is just making them legit seem crazy. Like where this fucking random Geoconda person is like, we're in a period of absolute irrationality, you know, and then, and then they go into the other part here where they say, uh, Vice President Murillo's recent speeches have been equally erratic, quote, a mixture of religion and insults, which rail constantly against coup plotters and Satanism. The government's narratives ex exhibit extreme levels of paranoia. No shit. They, there was a fucking coup plotted against your government. People saying that they want to decapitate you and drag you to the street like a dog and kill you. Of course, you're going to be speaking out against coup plotters and speaking out against imperialism. That's not paranoia. That's reality. And it's just, oh my God, this is crazy because that's, it's like gaslighting, right? Where you're making it seem like a person is crazy. Oh, look at this crazy person. There's a, well, I just got fucking attacked. Like I'm not crazy. You know? So it, it's just like psycho the psychological techniques that they use here are, are just insane. And just like you said, right, the, the pension reforms were impo being imposed by the IMF. It wasn't like, Ortega wanted to do that. I wanted to quickly read from this other article, Washington Post. Again, these are all articles coming out this week. Uh, this one came out last week. Prominent Nicaraguan opposition leaders and journalists flee an escalating government crackdown. Again, look at that headline. I mean, it's just like prominent Nicaraguan opposition leaders and journalists flee an escalating government. You know, just pay attention to the words that they use. Again, the same image, Ortega you know, in a mural of him to to make it seem like he's just like this horrible uh, dictator that he's painting it himself, you know, not the people defending their leader. The Washington Post, a stream of high profile opposition leaders, journalists and members of civil society fleeing Nicaragua has surged as the regime of President Daniel Ortega wages the most alarming political crackdown in the country's recent history ahead of a November election. In the last week, several of the most influential critics of the Ortega regime sneaked out of the country, convinced they would be detained if they remained. Journalists from mainstream media publications were stripped of their passports, but decided to leave anyway. Even some of Ortega's former top Sandinista comrades are seeking refuge abroad. The consequences for remaining in the country could be dire. Over the past several months, at least 16 opposition figures have been jailed. No mention of, of what they've done, by the way. Quote, they are imposing a state of fear in the country to immobilize the whole country and eliminate political competition for the coming election, says Carlos Chamorro, the publisher of the prominent digital newspaper Confidencial, who fled the country later this month. Look at his last name again, Chamorro, right? Mm -hmm. Chamorro left after police raided his house and after his sister, a presidential candidate, was arrested. Confidencial's offices had previously been raided by police. Journalists have also come under threat in recent weeks. Veteran journalist Miguel Mendoza was detained on June 21st when police broke into his home. The day before that, police arrested Miguel Mora, the former director of 100% Noticias. Mora had stepped down from his role at the outlet to run for president. So again, the same typical nonsense, typical propaganda. This, this paragraph is fucking disgusting. Ortega, 75, rose to power as a young revolutionary in the 1970s, a leftist whom Ronald Reagan once called a, quote, tin pot dictator. He ruled the country from 1979 to 1990 and has been in power again since 2007. While Ortega has made previous attempts to target his opposition, most notably in 2018, his current crackdown is widely seen as an escalation. The current wave of persecution has reached members of Ortega's former Fellow Sandinista commanders this week, former commander Luis Carrion was driven into exile after he heard his arrest was imminent. So just more nonsense, more disgusting uh, imperialist propaganda about Nicaragua. Your reaction, I mean, that to, to this piece of shit from the Washington Post. I can't really expect too much from the Washington Post, considering, you know, it is owned by Jeff Bezos. Um, That's true. <laughs> you know, they'll also put, they'll publish this and then they'll publish why we need to be more empathetic for, towards billionaires. Right. Why working class people need to actually be paying more uh, loans, actually. Uh, and so, I mean, this is, again, they keep, they keep uh, really amping up and trying to legitimize the chamorros, but they don't talk about how confidencial. Okay, they might say he's the publisher. Are we also gonna talk about how his whole family owns it? 
Are right. we also gonna talk about how they've received like, I mean, I'm talking big money, like big, big money so that they can have all of these publications and have different fronts for them too. Um, or, you know, they talk about Miguel Mora. Like I mentioned before, he said that uh, the U.S. government should attack and instead of having a full-on army, they should do it Noriega style in Panama, like how the U.S. did in 89. Um, the Mora is also, a, a, he's not a journalist, you know, fake, fake journalist, uh, that I think it was the gray zone. They had published an article and they mentioned how like Mora was given this award. Um, what was the, I don't know. I, it was like some organization of journalists, uh, but like it was the same organization that didn't even talk about Julian Assange, you know? And so like, right. we already see the the bias of, of these, um, these 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 organizations that aren't aren't legitimate uh, by any means. Um, yep, there it is. There it is about Miguel Mora. I mean, 100% noticias. When I went to Nicaragua, everyone was like, "Yes, yeah, 100% mentiras." Like, <laughs> look at it, and it's like it's not real. Like, it's a fake news publication, and so it's really, you know, I think this is where also it's so important for us to, as anti-imperialists, as socialists. Um, that we root ourselves to with like, a, uh, it doesn't even have to be that that complicated. Just a very rudimentary understanding of like where our political theory begins, because that that gives you a, such an important lens, so that even when you do see mainstream media, you can start asking the right questions and you can start investigating and seeing, you know, like oh, I keep seeing, like I keep seeing the chamorros pop up, like mm. you, know, and you, you might want to dig in more rather than just kind of reading something and seeing a surface level, and you might because you know you might not have the theoretical framework at the time to maybe think, oh. That that looks suspicious. So it's really kind of the the blending, right, of of yeah. having this theory and being able to put it into practice. Most definitely, and I want to give a shout out to uh, Ben Norton and the Gray Zone. Uh, ben Norton, I we got a chance to meet Ben uh, when we were in Nicaragua. He's a, he's a dope dude, really down to earth, really chill. A lot of times with journalists, you know, especially who do great work, sometimes there's a discrepancy, like they'll be, they'll have cool reports, but then you meet them in person and they're like weird or they're just arrogant. Ben is super chill. We had a good time. And a shout out to Ben and the Gray Zone. He has this great article, how USAID created Nicaragua's anti-Sandinista media apparatus now under money laundering investigation. I highly suggest you check out this article. I think it's one of the, the best articles out right now that's really doing a great job at debunking Chamorro and the media attacks against Nicaragua. I just want to read a few excerpts from it because I think it's important to, to lay some of this information out. The Chamorro Foundation is a central vehicle for Washington's massive financial, technical, and logistical support to the Nicaraguan opposition, acting as what the CIA refers to as a, quote, pass through a third party organization that serves as a seemingly independent channel for U.S. government funding to foreign political groups and media outlets. Since the, since the Sandinistas came to power in 2007, the U.S. has funneled tens of millions of dollars to opposition groups in Nicaragua through its soft power arm of the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, a CIA front that has long been used as, quote, humanitarian cover for operations to destabilize independent left-wing governments, especially in Latin America. Internal reports from USAID show that the agency does much more than fund anti-Sandinista political organizations, NGOs, and media outlets in Nicaragua. It births them, nurtures them, and trains them in every aspect of politicking from electoral strategies and public relations to outreach and social media messaging, branding, and marketing to organizing and building broad alliances, developing technology skills, and navigating legal issues to managing finances and accounting. This is classic astroturfing. I think we mentioned it in a previous episode about Cuba and the so-called uh, San Isidro movement. Astroturfing, astroturf is fake grass, fake, fake uh, you know, the grass that you have in your front or backyard. We know the term grassroots movement. So astroturfing is when you create a fake grassroots movement to make it seem organic and natural. And that's exactly what USAID has been doing in Nicaragua with this opposition, funding the opposition. 
This grace on the investigation illustrates how USAID has helped to create Nicaragua's anti-Sandinista opposition from the ground up. The right-wing political forces that compromise it are anything but organic. They are the product of an enormous campaign of foreign meddling by US government interference at every single level of Nicaraguan society. So they go into details. They have budgets, numbers, documents. All the sources are here. I highly recommend it. I mean, this is grade A investigative journalism by the homie, the comrade Ben Norton. Uh, shout out to them at the Gray Zone. Uh, they did an excellent job with, with that. Um, but just to kind of wrap up, uh, compañera Minta, what should people look out for in the next coming weeks? Obviously, we know that the elections are coming up pretty soon in November. What are some ways that, what are some, what's some advice that you have for people who are just learning about Nicaragua, but they're seeing this anti-socialist propaganda come out? Um, I think having like a crash course on the history of Nicaragua is helpful so that you can, you know, folks can better understand, you know, how did we get to this point, right? And why is it that the United States is so interested in 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 getting power uh, in this in the small country? Um, and so, really seeing, you know, the ways in which two people, working class people, have been able to cultivate a working class movement, a popular revolution, something that has dramatically improved the lives of millions of Nicaraguenses. Um, there is something to be said of how Nicaragüenses have a lower migration rate compared to our neighbors in Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala. And that is something that we need to seriously note and observe. Um, I would also, you know, be wary of, you know, reading articles that want to pose themselves as more left wing. Um, the levels and extent of media manipulation are extreme. And we know, especially here in the United States, but also in the West in general, it's not the people that run the media. It's we're not the ones that are, you know, getting the getting the funding to, to accurately or aptly report on what's going on. Um, and so, you know, even when we have domestic issues here in the United States, really seeing, you know, does the same publication truthfully and uh, in, in a way that is 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 that it invokes honor, right? Like honors the people that have also been impacted by dangerous um, policy imposed by the United States against its own citizens. Um, and so, I, I think for people, you know, we should be looking out for any any media that is aiming to frame Ortega as a dictator. He was popularly elected. Uh, there was, I'm sure, international election observers when he was reelected uh, previously four years ago, and that we'll, uh, we'll have observers there in, in November. I know of people who are going through the um, process to, to, I mean, it's it's a whole you have to submit your application and do everything. You know, there's there's going to be legitimacy there. It is a legitimate government. And, and you know, just speaking from my experience, I mean, I'm moving to Nicaragua in like a week. <laughs> I'm moving to Managua. So, you know, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be leaving the US if I if I didn't fully back and support the FSLN, if I didn't fully back and support my fellow um, Nicaraguenses as we're af actively fighting US imperialism. And um yeah, I just I just urge people to to be careful and um, you know really think critically and not if you have questions you know don't be afraid to to investigate uh, because there is a lot of of is huge huge misinformation campaign. I mean, even on the environmental aspect, I'll I'll end it off with this: like Nicaragua suffered hurricanes Ada and Iota in 2020 category four category five hurricanes me and ramiro we went to billy uh which mind you like almost half of nicaragua's territory land nicaragua being the largest country in central america half of it is autonomous indigenous territory with five different levels of governance the levels of like democratic engagement are very significant and i think a lot of people in the west that are on the left would benefit to to learn more about you know both the historical processes of nicaragua and also what are the reforms that the fsln has engaged in now today um and so the fact that, i mean of course the u.s the U.S. doesn't care about actually establishing land back or honoring the rights of indigenous people or women or anybody who really composes a working class. Um, so don't trust, don't trust these like big media publications um, 
that want to just frame Nicaragua as this dangerous place to be in when it's not. I mean, like they're talking about Nicaragua, but has the Washington Post published anything in relation to what's going on, I don't know, in like Honduras or El Salvador? I don't think so. <laughs> so um, I, that's, that's, that would be my advice, I think. Yeah. Oh, I think you're muted. My fault. Yeah, Parasocialite said, beware the ngo and U.S. State Department back synthetic left. That's exactly right. Jacobin, I'm just going to call you guys out. They had a, a horrible stuff on Nicaragua and uh, a lot of the synthetic left. And uh, that's that's really dope. Uh, I mean, the, the, you're going to be moving out there. Me, It's funny. Me, me and Ophelia talk about that all the time. We're like, yo, let's just fucking leave this hellhole of the U.S., move somewhere like Nicaragua. What are you most excited for, like, now that you're moving there and you're going to, you should start a channel, by the way, while you're out there, because, you know, it's it's good to, to share that information. But what are you most excited about to move there? I'm excited about so many things. Um, on, like, a very personal note, I got injured, like, a month ago. I had to have major surgery because um, I broke my foot. And so, like, I'm really excited to move somewhere where it won't cost me thousands of dollars to get medical care. Um, and that makes me really excited because I'm very eager to, recover and, and get back to normal, right? And so like, I'm excited about that. I'm excited, uh, you know, I'm gonna be living with um, other young revolutionary socialists in Managua. So like having that sense of community and really also like continuously pushing myself in my understanding of Nicaraguan politic and, you know, the construction of both like Nicaraguan identity and like what it means to be an anti-imperialist and really having that firsthand experience of like living in a country that is also I mean, unfortunately, it, it is sanctioned, but like having that firsthand experience, I think is crucial because then I, it's different, right? When you're visiting compared to when you live there. And so I would hope that, you know, with the months that I, as you know, months go on and you acclimate and, and, and you get more information, um, to really share that with a lot of my compañeros in, in, in North America and in the West, because it's important for people to recognize that, you know, these socialist governments that are led by the people, I mean, it's incredible what they're able to accomplish in spite of so much. Because again, we still need to be campaigning to end the sanctions. We still need to be campaigning to really have um, the full capacity to establish our self-determination and autonomy. And we don't want just, we just don't want that in Nicaragua. We want that everywhere. We want that in all of you know, for all of the working class internationally. So um, I'm excited about that. I'm also excited because I'm gonna see my family. I'm just excited in general. Like it's gonna be, it's gonna be really good. Um, I'll be interning with the friends of the ATC. So a lot of work to do on that front. And overall, I'm just, I'm, I'm ready. So July 12th, I get, I arrive. It'll be that's good. That's what's up. And then the rev, the anniversary of the rev revolution a week after. That's gonna be mad lit. And for those of you who are watching, listening, the anniversary in Nicaragua, July 19th of the 1979 revolution. Usually millions of people from across the country go to Managua and celebrate at the Revolution Plaza. And there's a lot of speakers from other countries as well. They have uh, invitations for international guests. I think last year or a year ago, or two years ago, it was uh, Delcy Rodriguez from Venezuela. Uh, Cuban Lee Fidel Castro has been to those back in the day. And it's just a really cool celebration. It's one of those moments where you forget about all the problems of sanctions because it's a lot of international fuckery that is against Nicaragua, but it's a day to just celebrate the revolution, revolutionary optimism, constructive socialism, and it's just a really dope experience. And that's really cool that you're going to be able to move there and live there. I wish I could move to Honduras, and but I can't because, you know, obviously we know how bad things are there right now, but Nicaragua is mad dope and uh, I'm really happy for you. I think you're going to be doing some some really great work. And if you're watching this thing, by the way, also, I, I want to give a shout out to Friends of the ATC. Please follow them on social media and the website, Friends of the ATC. If you want to go to Nicaragua on a delegation, on a forthcoming delegation, feel free to hit me up or hit up Friends of the ATC or Aminta. We, we can help you get situated there so you can go and, and see Nicaragua for yourself to learn about the country. I highly suggest it. It's just a beautiful place. It's so underrated uh, within the, the left. But... Compañera Aminta, it was really dope talking to you. Aminta is a 
Nicaraguan American sociologist based out of New Orleans, Louisiana. Shout out to New Orleans. I bet it's mad lit right now. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we don't celebrate 4th of July, but people are having a good time anyway. I mean, that currently researches transnational Central American identity, imperialism in the Americas, and different modes of social struggle and labor organizing. I mean, I really do hope you start a channel out there because I'm sure people are going to want to see all of the great stuff you're doing out there. I mean, you know what? I might, I might consider it. I am bringing my camera, so um, you know, maybe I, I will start a little channel. Um, you should. Anyway, I'm excited to see you. And okay, yes, yep. Nineteen. Turn up. Really fun. Um, and thank you as always for for having me on your show. No doubt. See you soon, comrade. Uh, peace out. Viva Nicaragua, Sandinista, and uh, take care. Peace mm -hmm. out. Peace out. Bye.